So for those of you who were with us a month ago in New Orleans, you heard a version of this presentation about warning and protective action. So I'm gonna give you a little overview of that again, just to refresh, get everyone back to thinking about it. Um, and then I'm gonna connect it to LifeSim for you and use Oroville as kind of an example to, of how each one of these components of our warning and evacuation timeline acts both in life sim and what it looks like in reality in a real event and link it back for you. So life loss essential elements, we've got five, give or take, right? So we start out, you, you had the structure inventories presentation earlier. Nick told you all the different ways that you can create that initial distribution of structures and people in your study area. Then through warning and evacuation, and our understanding of those parameters that, of those warning and evacuation parameters that make up our timeline that helps us define evacuation effectiveness, we redistribute that population at risk, right? And then Then based on those final shelter locations, we're putting people in low hazard or high hazard for each iteration in LifeSim and coming up with an estimate of fatalities, right? What's the single greatest source of natural variability when estimating life loss, direct life loss? It's that redistribution. Right. Then it was asking us while we were going through the workshop about what does LifeSim do? How does it route people? Like, does someone leave work and go home and then evacuate? No. We'll talk more about that. LifeSim uses something called Dijkstra's shortest path algorithm. So we're routing people to the nearest point of safety, user defined destinations, right? There's a whole bunch of variability in how people take protective action where they go and the timing related to when they choose to leave and when they receive a warning. It's, it's the most difficult component of estimating direct life loss from flooding. The reason I say, I keep saying direct life loss is because a couple years ago we really started to get into indirect life loss and we found out that that's even harder. So we've now made sure to make it clear that we're talking about direct life loss when we talk about redistribution of population. All right. Using LifeSim. So start with the hydraulic data, right? We start with our structure data, work on the attributes. You did a little bit of that in the workshop. Then we get into warning and evacuation. That's what we're gonna be talking about now. And we're gonna work into a workshop that goes through getting this information into LifeSim. Direct life loss. This is a bit of a, you know, talk to you. In LifeSim, we're estimating direct life loss consequences, right? We're not trying to estimate those secondary life loss consequences that you read about, particularly from hurricanes, Hurricane Maria, Katrina, a lot of events where you've seen indirect life loss, right? You've all seen this. And when we're thinking about risk, we're thinking about each one of these components, right? You know, Jesse, why are you talking to us about this when you're supposed to be talking about warning and evacuation for life sim? Well, it's because we spend a lot of time on this, right? And we've historically spent a lot of time on this, particularly in infrastructure safety. But if our goal is to understand what's driving risk for dams, levees, natural flood conditions, then we need to understand both the likelihood and the consequences. And we need to manage both the probability that floods occur and the impacts of those flooding, of flooding occurring, right? Which gets into consequences management. And that's where understanding not only the factors that 
impact the likelihood of take someone taking a protective action, but also understanding how you can use your understanding of those factors to manage those consequences, improve emergency preparedness and evacuation planning, and understand how those things can actually play a role in reducing risk as well without ever touching the structure, right? A lot of times what we're doing now is we're, we're, doing, we're managing both at the same time. So we might be considering a way to fix or improve an existing dam and also think about how we can effectively get people out of harm's way downstream. So when through this, risk management involves consequences management. There's two ways to reduce risk, right? Can I re reduce the likelihood that someone gets wet or we, we can reduce the, the impacts to that person from getting wet, right? Whether it's raising that structure off the ground, increasing the likelihood that they evacuate, providing reasonable shelter for people during emergencies, things like that. Life risk is paramount. You say our dam safety program came out early and said that life risk is paramount and that's also impacted levy safety as well, right? So we spent a lot of time trying to understand what's driving potential for life loss. Then embrace uncertainty. This is important because I just told you how much natural variability there is in redistribution of population at risk. Can only reduce uncertainty about these parameters so much, right? That natural variability is all, all, always going to exist. So what we do is we gather information and try to reduce it as much as is reasonably practical, right? Goals for this presentation, or I shouldn't say for this presentation. Go back to 2015 or so, the goals for this presentation. This was kind of a weak spot for us, right? We had deterministic curves. We weren't sampling uncertainty about these relationships and they were pretty dated. We recognized, particularly Jason and Woody, recognized that this was an area that needed improvement. So we connected with Drs. Dennis Maletti and John Sorensen and said, hey, can you help us? And they did. So part of their work, come up with a way to quantify how we can estimate human behavior, how humans are gonna respond during catastrophes. Help us understand those components and those factors that influence the likelihood of response or non-compliance, right? Develop measures to measure, develop ways to measure the local community behavior so that we could put this into a software, quantify it, and actually measure different outcomes across simulation, right? Resulted in an interview schedule and an Excel workbook. I'll get into that a little more. Prepare a local community guidebook. Send that out. Um, some of you have it from Consequences course, but we'll, we'll distribute that to this group as well. It's a great resource. Some acknowledgements, Dr. Maletti, Dr. Sorensen, um, Dr. Maletti sadly passed from complications from the coronavirus a couple years ago. Uh, Dr. Bowles, Susan Cutter, Dr. Lindell, Sacramento and Yolo County Emergency Managers. Add Mr. Lutz's name up here. I didn't yet, but I'll call him out. Nick's done a lot of work in the last couple of years to update our protective action initiation curves, our mobilization rates. Um, he found some, I don't want to say discrepancies, what would you say? Some information that suggested that empirical curves might lead us to treat those relationships a little differently. So made some updates. You didn't know what I was asking. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> We're very blunt. Yeah, modified some of the curves. There you go. That's what I'll say moving forward. Thank you all for sticking with us through that. All right, so this is what our warning and evacuation look, timeline looks like, right? Start over here. We're detected a threat. What, what I mean by that is we've identified, so before this timeline, you might have detected some sort of flaw. Could be sand boils on the land side of your levee, something like that. And we're out monitoring that situation. That doesn't meet the criteria of threat detected. When we mean threat detected, we're saying there is an imminent hazard that could lead to the destruction of people and property, and we need to act. That's what we mean by threat detected. Warning delay time is we've detected the threat and we've communicated it to local emergency managers, right? Whoever does. The time between when a local emergency manager, someone who issues an evacuation order, receives notice of the imminent hazard and the time that they issue that warning, warning to the public. It's that first public alert. So there's a delay 
in that period. Then once they pull the trigger and issue that warning, how long does it take for that message to reach their target population? And that's the warning diffusion time. Once that warning's received, how long does it take for people who receive a warning to take a protective action and evacuate? And then over here, you've got evacuation time. So once people get out on roads and are evacuating, how long does it take them to reach safety? All right, let's talk a little bit about the imminent hazard. Um, imminent hazard and imminent hazard identification time. Imminent hazard is the time when, sorry, time when something has definitely gone wrong. We'd say collapse the embankment time equals zero and HEC RAS for breach initiation. So that's what we mean by the imminent hazard. We're saying breach your levy. Um, non-breach would be initiation of, uh, your non-breach hazard would be initiation of damaging flooding. So releases from a dam that get over bank, flood homes, businesses, that could be a non-breach imminent hazard, right? Where you don't, you don't need to have failure of a flood defense structure for there to be an imminent hazard. Imminent hazard ID time, that's what we're going to define in LifeSim this week, right? It's always fun noises. Right. Yeah, that's right. Thank you for noticing. Imminent hazard ID time, that's the time when you are convinced that something is going to go wrong. So that breach might happen at time zero, but two hours before time zero, we might say, this is definitely going to breach. We need to take action and issue an evacuation order, right? So this is the parameter we're trying to define in LifeSim, and we do sample uncertainty about it. When you're going in LifeSim and bringing that hazard in, right, that flood hazard, you're going to define... With the, you'll see the first time step in green, that green dotted line over here of your hydraulic model, you're going to define where that imminent hazard is as part of your import for that particular hydraulic event, right? So you're saying, LifeSim, this is when that imminent hazard occurs. LifeSim's not reading off this hydrograph, right? We're just using it to help inform our definition of when that imminent hazard time occurs. Or, ideally, your hydraulic model will tell you when that time is in the hydraulic model, and that's what you can punch into LifeSim. When you're setting up your alternatives, relative hazard ID time right down here at the bottom, we sample uncertainty about that, right? We have a definition of when that imminent hazard occurs, but we don't know when that imminent hazard ID time is going to happen. Hazard ID happens sometime, generally, before the imminent hazard, could happen after, but generally happens sometime before. And we've got our communication and warning issuance delays, and that carries us closer to the imminent hazard. And then after those delays, that's when that first warning is issued. So your imminent hazard ID time might be two hours prior to breach, and then your delays take up an hour in which case your warning only gets issued an hour before your breach, even though your imminent hazard identification time is two hours before that, your breach. Does that make sense? A lot of head nods. All right, I'm going to say yes. Got it, Woody. You look very serious. All right, now I'm going to go through the warning and evacuation timeline before I get into the nuts and bolts. Can everyone stand up? Come on, Adam, you're the tallest one in here. I got to guess. <laughs> All right. How many of you own a landline? If you, own a, if you own a landline, sit down. How many of you have opted out of emergency alerts on your cell phone? Sit down. I did this wrong. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Landline. Oh, how many of you? Yeah. How many, if, you, if you're opted into emergency alerts on your cell phone, sit down. So you'd still be standing. So somebody help that guy out. That's how this is supposed to work. Because there's no way to wake you up at night. Right? 
You, there's no emergency alert that can get to you. You don't have a landline unless there's an audio siren. We really have no means of waking you up unless you have a NOAA, NOAA weather radio or something like that. So one of the biggest challenges when we issue warnings is having the ability to wake people up at night, right? A dam breach would be bad any time of day. Rapid onset an event that fails a dam, you know, Teton's a good example. Even if it's high noon, there's, it's catastrophic, people lose their lives. If it happens at night and there's no way to wake people up, a rapid onset event like that can be truly catastrophic and you'll see life loss in the hundreds, right? Like we've seen in instances like St. Francis is, is dated at this point, but the equivalent of something like that. So hop back into your emergency alerts. This is where I'm going with that. All right, getting into the timeline. Warning delay. Like I said, I'm gonna talk a little bit about how this gets into LifeSim, right? I'll show you the default curves that we have in LifeSim. I'm gonna relate this back to the Orville event. I'm gonna explain the components and the factors that impact each one of these components along the timeline. All right, warning delay. Primary components, plan is written down, SOP to support the plan is written down, triggers, warning delay, think of, think of writing it down and actionable thresholds as big ones, right? If we reach a certain point in our river and we know that we need to start moving people, that could happen well before a breach occurs, right? Which could really drive down consequences. And then when you have dams and levees, rules and procedures are in place for how to communicate with the emergency manager and how to respond to dam and levee emergencies, right? In the absence of some of this stuff, if you were to see kind of an ad hoc approach where people are figuring this out on the fly in real time when an emergency is unfolding, that's the type of thing that can extend this delay significantly, which means that instead of a warning going out minutes, tens of minutes after an emergency manager is made aware of an of a imminent hazard, it could go out hours later, and that can significantly increase the number of people who end up being exposed to a life-threatening hazard, right? This is an example of warning threat triggers. You'll see that it escalates and the actions change. So we encourage anytime we go out and we do an elicitation, anytime we connect with emergency managers, this is often something that's missing and this is often something that we encourage the emergency management community to develop. At could be at the local level, could be at the state level. Um, Oftentimes it's at the county level and the emergency responder level when we're interacting with, with those groups. In LifeSim, we've got a series of curves. This is a, it's called the Lindell distribution. It's a rendition of the Rayleigh distribution, I believe. But how, do, how you read this is we're saying, if you're well prepared, in the blue here, we're saying the likelihood of that warning issuance delay being 15 minutes is very high the likelihood of it being 120 minutes is much, much lower. It's still possible, but highly unlikely. Then if you move to ad hoc, you can see that that curve flattens out quite a bit. And our most likely outcome is somewhere in the 90 to 120 minute range. What's happening during this period, if you're not prepared, is you might be figuring out how to reach people, so what communication channels are available to you if you don't have that written down or well-established already. You might be writing, drafting a warning message in real time, right? And you might be trying to figure out the boundary of the, the geographic boundary that you need to establish to warn all the people within that area, right? And that can take a fair amount of time if you haven't figured those things out already. How many familiar with the Oroville event? Most of you. All right. So, February of 2017, a lot of rain in California in winter 2017, and then rain and runoff happening together because of warm weather. That's how we have floods in California. So, February 7th, got an issue on the main spillway, there's a hole in the spillway, right? We're gonna shut it down and inspect the spillway. Inflows ramp way up 
don't have time to fix the spillway. So we've got to start increasing our outflows so that we don't overtop and lose the dam. Testing the spillway between February 7th and February 12th. February 12th, that afternoon is when the emergency spillway overtopped for the first time since it was constructed 50 years prior, right? And it's, it's hard to see, but flood control spillway outflows raised to 100,000 CFS. So that was the main spillway that had an issue in it, right? Part of it had got chewed out, it's missing. Mandatory evacuation order issued shortly thereafter, right? And then outflows increased all the way up to 100,000. 2 p.m. that afternoon, concern about erosion moving toward the spillway, potential that it could reach the monolith in two hours. Photos reviewed by incident command show that that erosion continues to move. Someone says in um, emergency office, it was set up by CAL FIRE, it's being run by CAL FIRE, right? It's a CAL FIRE op. Does the sheriff know about this? Sheriff Mahoney was just about to go home for the weekend, been there for a long time. He heard someone say, does the sheriff know about this? Poked his head in. 30 minutes later, later DWR official states that erosion could breach the spillway embankment within the hour and send a 30 foot wall of water downstream, right? So this, so let's bring that back to our timeline, warning delay time. So 3.30, when we say DWR official says, this is gonna breach, could breach in an hour, 30 foot wall of water. That's our imminent hazard identification time, right? With an expectation potentially that our imminent hazard is happening in an hour. Decision was made 21 minutes later to evacuate. And 51 minutes later, first evacuation order was sent. What do you think was happening for those 51 minutes? Or those 30 minutes after the decision to evacuate was made? Yep. Trying to figure out the language of the warning. What else? Sorry? The yeah. Didn't have breach modeling for the emergency spillway. Only the man, main dam embankment, the tallest dam in the country. I think something like over 30 million CFS for a full dam breach. Some some incomprehensible amount of water. So he took looked at the floodplain on the map from the main dam breach, and he just said, "Tell me when to stop." And that's how they geofenced the area that was going to receive that evacuation order, right? So what did that look like? Well, after the fact, we got back with Dr. Miletti and Dr. Sorensen and said, can you, can you do kind of a post-event evaluation of this? Part of that was an elicitation where we got an understanding of what emergency preparedness planning was in place prior to the event. And this is what that curve ended up looking like. And I'll talk to you more about the, the, the interview schedule and the scoring sheet. But what we do, we go out and meet with emergency managers as we go through an interview schedule that came from Dr. Miletti and Sorensen's work back in 2015. And we ask a series of questions. I think it's 53 questions. Some of them have sub questions. We take all that information some of it requires interpretation, so we like to go in small groups. We get it into a scoring sheet to help us build these relationships that we ultimately end up using in life. It does two things. Helps us do a much better job with estimating life loss consequences. So helps us inform our risk assessment and ultimately our recommendations and developing risk mitigation strategies. It also helps us take the information they gave us, put it into a LifeSim model, and link back up with them after and say, this is what we learned from LifeSim about potential issues during evacuation. This is what we learned from the information you gave us during the elicitation that could identify potential opportunities for improvement. 
After we did that, we came up with this curve. Looking at this, it would have said that our most likely outcome was 30 minutes, but you don't have that spike like you do with the well-prepared distribution, well-prepared. So we're still in the fat part of that bell curve with 51 minutes. Yes? So when you came up with this curve, you, uh, here you image managers from the owner side, the owner side, or from the account side? It's going to be, right. Thanks. Yeah, no. Thank you. That's a good question. We're not, we're talking about meeting with emergency managers. We're talking about emergency managers downstream. So local stakeholders downstream of dams. Certainly we, when we hold those elicitations, we include um, infrastructure owners and operators because it's important for those conversation, those linkages to exist, right? Dam owner and operator should know the emergency managers that live immediately downstream. Good question. Thanks for asking. Okay. Check on learning. What could the Butte County Sheriff have done prior to the Orville Dam incident to shorten the warning issuance delay time? Communicate with EMAs from neighboring counties to ask them to prepare for evacuation. Tell people in Butte County to pack their bags. They might need to evacuate. Draft message templates with specifics like the source of the alert and the alert's target location. Evacuate people in low-lying areas along the river in Butte County as soon as the emergency spillway was overtopped. Anybody? Okay, let's see. Any others? Yeah, I think there's value in all of them, right? Particularly drafting emergency templates and A and B. Um, certainly, in D, you can move people near the river ahead of time. That's going to help. So these are all things that could have been done prior. <laughs> all right, moving on to warning issuance time. Well, you know what time it is. Warning diffusion times. You have 15 minutes. 15 minutes, okay. I have to hustle. Warning diffusion. Animation didn't jump. Really, what we're trying to figure out with warning diffusion, particularly when we're meeting with emergency managers, is how many channels do you have available to you to reach the target population at risk, the group that you're trying to warn? In order, re using reverse 911, everyone will get an alert on their cell phone, except for this guy. Warning diffusion curve. So what we're sampling here is, okay, if we don't have any information, we're going to sample a curve that looks something like this, where we look at curve with the widest range of uncertainty based on the research that Dr. Miletti and Dr. Sorensen did. What we're trying to do when we meet with emergency managers is reduce the uncertainty about this curve. And that comes from us asking questions about various kinds of communication devices that they might have available to them, right? And you can see the value in that here. In Butte County and Yuba and Sutter County, some people receive warning through traditional methods. Grandma called and said, you need to get out. Modern social media could be Twitter. And then informal, sorry. Traditional would be radio and TV. Informal would be your neighbor. You see your neighbor comes and knocks on your door, right? And you can see that this is fairly well distributed. Yuba and Sutter downstream, almost a third for each. Um, with Butte County, immediately downstream, informal is actually quite a bit higher. So a lot of people receiving notice from their neighbors or friends, family, whatever. And that's what's eliciting a response. You move to the two counties further downstream, they're getting their information from TV, from radio, things like that. Why? You hear an order like that, and if the message isn't well developed, or you don't have all the information that you want to have before you pack up your family and leave, what are you going to do? Go turn on the TV, right? 
try to find more information. Protective action initiation, message, content, and style. The best thing that you can do to elicit a protective action response is to have well-developed messages. That's a key find is research. These are the primary factors. Again, these are available in the warning, public warning guidebook, but primary takeaway, example messages or templates are written down and they include the key components, right? Procedures are in place to deliver messages repeatedly. So if you need to deliver the same information again, you do it at recurring time intervals. If the message changes, that happens immediately, right? And then you're still delivering it regularly. By delivering it regularly, you're letting people know that the situation hasn't changed. You still need to take this protective action, right? All right, single most important thing an emergency manager can do to motivate effective public protective action is message content. It should include source, say who the message is from. You wanna make sure that it's from a credible source. If it's a source that people don't recognize or aren't aware of, that could be an issue. Threat, make, using plain English and other languages if you have large populations of people that speak English as a second language, but speaking plainly, describe the threat. Location, where, what's the boundary of for the group of people that needs to evacuate and who's outside of the evacuation boundary, right? We wanna limit the number of people who evacuate that don't need to because they could use up resources that people that do need to evacuate need access to. Guidance, time. Tell people how much time they have before they need to take a protective action. Is it leave now or you'll die? Or is it you need to be, reach safety in six hours? And then expiration time. How long is this message good for? And that gets back to being sure that you repeat it regularly. Be clear, evacuate if you're near the river. That's kind of subjective, right? How do you qualify near? If you are between the river and First Street, move north of Main Street. That's pretty clear. Use local landmarks that people will understand. <laughs> Don't say 10,000 cubic feet of second flow. That doesn't mean a whole lot to a lot of people. It's gonna be 20 feet of water moving quickly by your local Starbucks. That's gonna ring. Right. All right. These are example message templates. Um, I believe you have the slides, so I'm not going to re read through these, but these are also available in the warning guidebook and they're color coded with those different components, right? Source, threat, and so on. These are really helpful. This is a resource that we, that was created as part of this research for local emergency managers so that they could look at stuff like this and put together message templates for themselves. And this is an example of a protective action response curve, right? Again, we're sampling a fair amount of uncertainty. If you go into LifeSim, you'll see that there's quite a few available in our default suite of curves. And then if we do go through the warning and, excuse me, warning and evacuation elicitation, we update those curves using the scoring sheet. And then one thing that Woody added a couple of years ago that's really cool is you can see the combined warning and PAI curve. So we're sampling all these different curves. When you combine them all together, what does that look like? How do I know how many people could evacuate two hours after warning? Well, now we've got this curve in LifeSim that shows us the range and gives you mean, the median, and the min, and the max with 90% confidence. So you can say, okay, at two hours, somewhere between 25 to 30% of people and 85% of people will evacuate. That's a All right, check on learning. Um, I think one, the single most important thing an emergency manager can do to motivate the public to take protective action is B? Yes, nice. Pick one, message content should be short and sweet so people don't waste time. Specific about the weather and how it relates to the hazard. Include hazard, source, hazard, weather, egress routes, time available to take protective action, or include source, threat, location, guidance, expiration time. 
Yes. Nice. Okay. Already talked about this a fair bit. We like to get out and meet with emergency managers, go through the interview schedule, and try to get a better understanding of their existing emergency response planning so that we can reduce uncertainty about the curves that we place in LifeSim when we do this analysis, right? We have this public warning guidebook, it's visually appealing to. We use the inter we provide this, we use the interview schedule, we gather information, we come up with these relationships, right? This is a tear away of the interview schedule in the first couple questions, and this is gives you an idea of what the scoring sheet looks like. Behind each one of the these factors, there's weights. Certain factors are primary, right? We have secondary factors and tertiary factors, and those primary factors are going to be weighted more heavily. Once we go through an elicitation, we take all that information, we get it into the scoring sheet. It's really important that after we use that information, we go through our risk assessment, we build that life sim model, that we reconnect with emergency managers because what we can do with this information is identify potential opportunities for improvement. We can link it back to the questions and we can say, based on how, based on the information you provided us and how we interpreted it, here are some potential opportunities for improving your existing emergency response planning. Most of the time, a lot of these things are low cost fixes, right? Could be as simple as someone using the public warning guidebook and drafting messaging templates, right? It doesn't always mean investing in a, an expensive siren system or a whole bunch of different communications resources, right? These are generally low cost. If it's between this and modifying a dam for millions of dollars, it could be that this provides significant risk reduction. Same thing with warning diffusion. See, this says warning issuance, so parts of the scoring sheet link back to each one of the elements on the timeline. Do the same thing with warning diffusion, and then again, same thing with protective action initiation. This is really valuable information for an emergency manager to have. Faces over it. A couple common myths in the emergency management community. Um, less so now. Where these are getting um, kind of disproven. But Fry Wolf syndrome, the idea that if you tell people that they need to evacuate and they do and nothing bad happens, that they won't the next time. That's not true. Um, as long as you can explain and provide detail about why you issued that evacuation order in the first place. If people are made to understand what information led to you making that decision as an emergency manager, they're just as likely to respond to an evacuation order the next time. One thing Sheriff Mahoney did, Butte County Sheriff, after Orville event, he went out around and talked to anybody who asked and explained exactly why he issued that order. He acknowledged kind of some of the faults and how they got to issuing that order, including not being fully prepared to deal with a situation like that. And he really made himself available, I don't wanna to say to take a beating, but he answered a lot of questions from a lot of people. And so if he were to issue an evacuation order again today, hopefully he doesn't have to, I think people would be very likely to listen. Traffic accidents, this idea that if you put a whole bunch of people on the road all at once, it's going to increase the like potential for traffic accidents. It's not really true. What research tells us is traffic accidents actually decrease because traffic is moving at slowly, slower speeds. Everyone understands that there's an emergency unfolding and that everyone's trying to get out, more likely to be courteous, more of a we're all in this together sort of atmosphere. So
might be emergencies. Um, really, the information in here can be used for any type of emergency, even if you got outside of flooding, right? So, um, but this is where it's most often applied in use case. All right, check on learning. If you issue an evacuation order and nothing bad happens, people are less likely to respond to future orders. True or false? Yes. What is one way to reduce uncertainty in life sim about the input parameters related to warning and evacuation? Go through an elicitation with local EMAs, use the well-prepared curves, estimate life loss without warning to see how much life loss estimates change, run life sim with deterministic curves. A. These are all ways, actually. Yeah, I just realized that should probably be what's the most appropriate way. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think we worded it this way on purpose. Maybe maybe we were feeling a little cheeky when we did, but yeah, it's the appropriate way. Each one of these things would accomplish the same goal, but absolutely, A is what we were looking for. All right. Distribute this, guide to public warnings. If you have questions about how to use any of this stuff, if you're interested in using any of this stuff, please reach out to us. We'd be happy to talk with you about it.